Millions of people are saved and lost. Are superstitious about prayer. And it depends on whether they get their answer or not, whether they continue in prayer. Now, come on. You know, some of you just quit praying. I mean, you've been praying for something and then get the answers, and you say to yourself, oh, this thing doesn't work. I'm going to throw the lucky stone away. I'm going to talk to you as a 70-year-old man that's experienced some things in life, but I think I have the right and the liberty to say this. I, I can honestly say I don't think there's anything that you've traveled or will be traveling that I haven't already traveled. So when I began this, this, uh, this morning by saying, do you believe in prayer? And I answered, no. I'm saying to you, it's not that I don't believe in prayer. I believe in a God who hears and answers prayer. Now, there's a world of difference there. If you don't get that right off the bat, then you're going to have a problem. And that's maybe the reason why some of us quit praying and some of us bow our heads once in a while before a meal because it's supposed to do that because the preacher said you're supposed to do that. You went out to eat with somebody. They bowed their heads in prayer. So, so you go ahead and bow your head in prayer and say, thank you, Lord, for this old biscuit. Thank you for this burnt beef. And thank you for this and blah, 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 whatever the case may be. And that's all prayer means. And it's not because of any reason except that you have prayed for certain things and have not occurred, and you don't believe that prayer works. Or you don't understand that prayer works. Or now you don't care whether prayer works or not. You're going to make it out on your own. I've been here starting on my 19th year, and I've seen it. You say, do you get discouraged when you don't see people grow in the grace and knowledge? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I got enough to answer for myself. You answer for yourself. And I'm honest with you this morning. I'm speaking from a heart of love. You'll answer. Maybe you are answering. But you will answer, and I will answer. I hope that you understand what we're trying. Many people are sincere, what we're trying to say here. Many people are sincere about God's promises and then find themselves struggling with prayer. I turn me to Matthew chapter 21. Let me go quickly now. Uh, because I want to finish this message. Uh, this is not a freight train message. Most of my messages are freight train messages. By this I mean that you can uh, just cut off the cars and put a caboose and start next week on the thing. But this is not a freight train message. This is a Amtrak special. And every car stays in line, or when you get to the end, no matter where you put that caboose, it's going to be the wrong place. Matthew chapter 21. Let me read something to you. Look at verse 22. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. I see television jerks, excuse me, television preachers. I hear radio uh, preachers. <laughs> the word jerk seems to stay in my mind for this moment. Let me get it away. All this, all you got to do is ask God. If you believe it, you'll receive it. Well, I don't know about you, but boy, there's some things I've asked for I haven't got. I also want to say this. <laughs> uh, four or five years later, I'm sure glad I didn't get them. Amen? Well, now get with it. You can say amen. Keith, wake up. All right, boy, buddy. That's it. Get with this program here. John, you guys in the back. Look at that sunburnt batch back there. Boy, I'll tell you, aren't they nature lovers? All right. But now get this message. I mean, haven't you prayed? Have you taken that promise? That's God's promise, amen? No question about that. That's God's promise. I like the way I flipped over that cord real nice. Ah, that's God's promise. Look at that thing, verse 22. And all things whatsoever he shall ask in prayer, believing he shall receive. That's why I don't believe in prayer. Because I've asked and I haven't gotten. So I don't believe in prayer. I've gone one notch higher than that. I believe in a God who hears and answers prayer. And I hope you get to see this thing. It's all in the attitude, friends. It's all in the realization of who you are, what you are, and what God wants for you. Listen, my friend, Jesus Christ died for you. Amen? God loves you so much 
that he gave his son to become a propitiation, became a substitute for you. He died. He bled and died, suffered, bled and died on that cross. He went to hell for you. He came forth alive forevermore. And now he lives at just at the right hand of the Father, and we have the hope of eternal life. We believe that. Well, why do you believe that? Because it says so. Then why don't we believe what God says about prayer? God has provided a salvation. God has provided a new birth. Listen, my friend, when God saved you, not only did he provide his Savior for you, but he did something else. He did something that nobody or nothing could do that you couldn't do for yourself. He put a person to live inside of you. And I'll be speaking about him tonight. And I'll tell you this right here now, my friend. That's the reason for the lack of power in the church today. There is one group of folks who take the Holy Spirit of God completely out of context, and then there are those of us who kind of just put him aside. The only reason you are born again, the only reason you are a new creature in Christ Jesus is because God placed his Holy Spirit in you. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God your body and spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. My friend, that's the provision of God. Now understand some things, my friends. I'm talking from God's viewpoint about prayer. I'm talking about God's viewpoint from everything. God provided for you a salvation, a substitute. He who took your place. God made you a new creature in Christ Jesus by placing his Holy Spirit in you. God then went a little bit further than that. He gave you a holy word, and God help us today, how we've mutilated God's word. He's given us the holy word of God, which we no longer say. We read it, we memorize it, but we don't understand the contents of this marvelous book, the depth of it. Now, he gave us God's Holy Spirit on the inside to be able to teach us the Word of God. But no, no, we'd rather listen to some radio preacher. We'd rather listen to some, uh, uh, get some book, and you go to a thousand. You can go. My friend, why is there, if the will of God is the will of God, why are there a thousand books written on the will of God? Books written on the Word of God, on the will of God. I mean, everybody's got a different viewpoint of the will of God. Well, listen, when you want to know what the will of God is, get God's viewpoint of it. Now, let's get off this book stuff. There's nothing wrong with reading stuff. But my dear friend, we, can, we are totally, completely devoted to reading something from a, book, from a book and ignoring God's Word. And all things whatsoever we shall ask, in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Okay, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, that's just a short distance away. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse 19. Again I say unto you, 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 that if two or of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they, sh that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. That's what it says. Wonderful promises, aren't they? But I'm going to tell you something. They have proved more discouraging than encouraging to sincere Christians. I've read God's Word, and I've looked at these portions of God's Word, and I say, well, that's what he says. Ask anything. Believe it. You shall receive it. There's two of you together. Together, pray about something. You shall receive it. Believe it. You shall receive it. And I'll tell you this right here now, my dear friend. If you believe in prayer, then you've got a problem. Because here it is, he says so. You've got a problem. Because it, it becomes more discouraging, it becomes encouraging. My wife and I uh, knelt down and we prayed about things. Uh, uh, we, we, well, let me, I've told you before, we prayed about a little thing, but that, uh, and prayed together, we were honest together, we were confessed our sin together, everything was just exactly the way we had, but I still had to go to the cemetery, take my little baby girl, and put her in a hole ground. I'm going to tell you something. That portion of God's Word, unless you understand it, is more discouraging than it is encouraging. Do you believe in prayer? No. I believe in a God who hears and answers prayer. I don't make prayer the primary point. I make God the primary point. God, the, you know, that's somebody we've left out of our thinking many times. Many have asked for physical healing. Daily employment. I mean, I, I see people... I, you know, I, I, I see this thing on TV until I get, um, I, I won't say what happens, but I, I, I get that way. I mean, one guy gets healed, another guy doesn't. What, well, the problem is him, it's, it's his fault. No, 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 no. It doesn't say anything about that at all. It just says that if you ask God, believe him, he'll answer your prayer. 
So how come one guy got healed, one kind didn't? Well, you, you have all kinds of excuses. They get all kinds of scripture verses jumping in there. Better be careful about that. Many of them ask for daily employment, deliverance from temptation, and so on and so forth, and become disappointed, and it has left scars on your spiritual soul. Now, now, now don't, don't sit there and look at me like as if uh, uh, you are holier than thou or holier than me. I'd say this, if I asked you to hold your hand up, but I won't do that for anything in the world, there isn't one of you that haven't been disappointed in prayer. You've asked for something, didn't receive it. Something wrong. No, not something wrong with God. Before seeking the explanation, let us first be totally honest and acknowledge that this is a fact, that we have been disappointed in prayer, that we have been disappointed in prayer. I can honestly say this. Uh, I, I believe, I, I, really, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I never did pray for a wife. <laughs> See? I just want to let you know that I'm human. I never prayed for a wife. I have more fun than with a bunch of guys than I would ever have with a wife. I knew a wife was kind of hold you down. Oh, you chicken livered guys, you won't even... <laughs> Won't say, wife sitting beside you, you won't say one way or the other, will you, huh? My wife had to leave for a minute, so I guess I'm all right, I'm free to speak. She is not in this room, is she? Oh, there she is, honey. I was just kidding, honey. Anybody got a spare bedroom? <laughs> I'm going to need one for about a week or two. I never prayed for a while. I never prayed for a while. When I got saved, God knew my heart. God knew what my desire would be. He gave me a wife that would agree with me, with my purpose. Now, slow down here just a minute, okay? I needed a wife. Didn't know it at that time. This is going to be my final point. I needed a wife, my friend, who would be willing to sit home while her husband was not preaching. I needed a wife who would have all the comforts of home when he had a associate pastorship in Ohio and had the world. Could take her for cruises and take her any place up. Got her a home and fixed it up just like I wanted it, just like she wanted it. I needed a wife who, after I had it fixed up, six months later would have to say goodbye to it because he felt that God had spoken to his heart that was the people in New York City who needed the Lord Jesus. Not that there weren't other preachers here, but just my part of the, of the job. I needed a wife who would be willing to say, uh, it doesn't make a difference whether I'm happy or unhappy. I needed a wife who would be able to say uh, goodbye to two, uh, one and three nights, one and three, eight, one and seven nights, a baby, bo uh, grandsons, and say, I'm going to leave you because my husband is going to Staten Island. I needed a wife like that. God knew that. I didn't know that. I'm glad I didn't pray for a wife. God might have given me one. Listen to me, please. God might have given me one, but not what he wanted for me. Now, you keep that thought in mind as we go along. Ask and you shall receive. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. Thank God he doesn't always give us that, huh? Paul prayed three times, remember? Three times he prayed, and then he didn't pray anymore. God says, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. The reason Paul, Paul was wise. He knew the Bible. He only prayed three times for that. If he'd have prayed any more than that, God would have given it to him, and he'd have never been the apostle that he was. Why did he only pray three times? Because he followed the example of his Lord and Savior when he prayed in the garden and said, Father, let this cup pass from me three times. You know, there are some stoppers in the Bible. You better remember that. Now listen, this is not just a funny book. This is not just something that you take and dust off every once in a while and put you... Listen, this is a book of life. A book of life. Now, do you understand it? Do we understand each other when we get off on this point right now? Come on, you can smile. I'm, I'm just... I, <laughs> I'm chicken in the inside. I have to bark real loud to make it look like I could bite, but I couldn't bite anybody for anything. I just, just relax a little bit. Let's understand the explanation. I'd ask you for anybody to raise these hands, but I'm I just as sure as you're sitting here, 
Now, some of you have been disappointed. In fact, everybody here has been disappointed in prayer. Maybe some of you young people haven't because you're overwhelmed with uh, a prayer that's been answered to you, uh, and right now it's overwhelming to you, and you've forgotten about some of the time. There was a time when your faith was rudely shaken. There was a time. There was a time when my faith... I mean, it says, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, let me say this to you. Again, I say unto you that two of you shall, uh, shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And my wife and I sincerely and honestly pray for little Beth Ann. But God chose to take our little flower and plant her in heaven. My faith was shaken. Two of you agreed. Nothing happened. I found myself struggling with doubt and rebellion. And then, thank God, I began to find some answers. Turn me to Philippians chapter 1. If you have a Bible, turn to it very quickly now, because I'm not going to take a lot of time. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, see somebody doesn't have a Bible and you'd like to sit alongside them and let them read it fine, but that's up to you. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. It's a Bible-believing church. The Bible says it or else it's not, it's not worth looking at. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 6. Being confident this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. Always in every prayer. In every prayer. Always in every prayer. See, Paul had some things settled in his life. He had a mind fixed. He had his eyes focused. He understood what God's Word said. He said, look, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. I see there's two things there, fella. Young lady, there's two things there. He's making requests, but with what? Joy. Now, if you've had prayers that haven't been answered, how can you make requests with joy? How can you make requests with joy? How? Hey, are you a stoic? You just tough it out? How do you, listen, how do you make requests with joy? And right now, I've, I've attracted some attention from some of you. Up to this time, uh, uh, some of you have just been wondering, well, it's going to be one of these messages on prayer. Well, it is. It's going to be a message on prayer. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He says he's going to perform it. I may not have had prayers answered, may have had prayers answered. That's immaterial at this present time. I'm confident of one thing, that he which hath begun a good work in me, the day I got saved, he which hath done a good work in me, according to this word of God, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Folks, it's, it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly divide. A number of you have come to this church, you've been confused. You've been following something one way or the other. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up. And you begin to rightly divide the word of truth, and all of a sudden you begin to see light at the end of the tunnel. You begin to see light at the end of the tunnel. Of course, Murphy says, be careful of that light at the end of the tunnel. It could be a freight train coming. We know better than that. It dawned on me that there must be equal time in prayer with Bible study. I found that I had not been obeying 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved. And that's where most of us stop. Study to show thyself approved unto God. You're not to prove anything to me. I'm not to prove anything to you. You're not to prove anything to anybody else. My friend, when you prove to God that you've studied to show yourself to be approved unto God, then everything else falls. That's the first and second commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. One, then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We're all wanting to love our neighbor. We're living in a, in a country that wants to love our neighbor. Let's love our neighbor, president says. Let's love our neighbor. Let's give you, you take more of your taxes so we can love your neighbor. He doesn't want to work, but that's all right. You should love him. He don't want to work. He's too lazy to work. He doesn't want to work. That's all right. You should love him anyhow. Give us more taxes so we can go ahead and give him something. <laughs> you say getting into politics. No, it's just common sense. I bust my uh, chops. 
I'm going to say a few other things. I work hard. I provide for myself. Somebody doesn't want, well, you don't seem to understand. No, you don't seem to understand. Don't, don't approach me with that silly, silly kid stuff. I have been young, and I've been old, the psalmist says back in Psalm 37. And I've never seen God said, God seed begging. This church will take care of its own. You're here this morning, and, whoops, I'm losing part of my, my control here. I don't know what, what is this supposed to do? Anything? Huh? I was preaching in Kansas City last week, and one of these things fell off, and I was perspiring, and the water was dropping off my chin, and it dropped on that thing there, and so I did something very silly. I, I, I was going to lick the sweat off there. I didn't know what to do, but I wipe it off or what. So I pretended like I was, and I bit the thing, and it, all the juice, the sparks flew out of that thing, and I lost the microphone. So. Tell you something. It's amazing the problems I get into just being trying to be a decent guy. Study. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. Not ashamed to the world, not ashamed to the people who speak to, but ashamed before God. First John chapter 2, verse 28. When you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, that you may be confident and not be ashamed. Can't shame me. Can't shame us people from Staten Island. <laughs> Pretty hard to shame a Staten Island or a New York City guy, isn't it? Pretty, pretty, shy, pretty tough to shame you. I tell you, boy, when you stand before him who loved you and gave himself for you, and see those holes in his hands, and his feet, and the hole in his side, and see that those two eyes like burn a fire, you will be ashamed, and so will I. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. A workman that, not uh, knowing the word of God, not studying, uh, but a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And I'm already starting to rough, run off on rabbit trails, not, trails and I don't want to do that. A workman that needs, you need to readily divide the word of truth. I had claimed these promises, Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 18. There's another one over there in Mark chapter 11. I won't go to that. Uh, that's on the same order. I claimed these promises without even inquiring whether these promises have been made to me or not. Oh, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. Why, it's the Bible. All the Bible's for me. Sure, it's for you, but rightly divide, he said. It was then the mystery of God's purpose and plan became a reality to me. There were some popular explanations about unanswered prayer. And folks, I went through them all. I researched them. I put them through Hegel's philosophy and Hegel's philosophy, and I came up uh, with a synthesis, and I'd shove that thing back into a, uh, a thesis and then run it back into an antithesis, and I, I went through that thing, purifying it, purifying it, and you know what? All the purifying I did, I still didn't get prayer answered. But I got some answered. Bound to hit one once in a while that pleased God. There's the divine factor in answer prayer. I finally came to this concussion. This conclusion to some people wasn't a concussion to me. I finally came to this conclusion. That there's a divine factor. You know what? You read the book of Job, you'll never find one place that Job ever understood why he had that trouble. I used to scratch my head about that thing. I said, God put Job, God permitted the devil put Job through all this stuff. And you know, you won't find one place where God ever told Job why he put him through it. God, Job says, well, God, explain to me. Uh, after uh, 41 chapter, 40 chapters, he said, God, explain to me. God says, okay, I'll explain to you. He said, I made the stars. <laughs> I made the moon. I made the... <laughs> well, God, I know you're the God of creation, uh, but, uh, but, you know, how come I didn't... How come? What did I do wrong? What I, uh, God says, uh, and, and then I made this, and I made that, and, and who are you to question me, and blah, blah. You know, Job never did get answered prayer. So I said, well, it's got to be the divine factor. You just got to tough it out, that's all. Now, I can tough it out, but some people can't. Well, I can tough it out to a point, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a divine factor. Then there's the human factor that I thought, well, hey, you know, it says over the first Peter chapter 3 that if you and your wife are having some problems, that your prayers are hindered. <clears throat> Let me go through that again. If you and your wife are having some problems, then your prayers are hindered. <clears throat> Let me go through that again. If, you're, if you have problems with you and your wife, uh, uh, then your prayers are hindered. <clears throat> Should I go through it again? It's amazing how most, uh, many people are willing to sit down and pray with anybody, except their wife. You know why it's hard to pray with your wife? And husband, why it's hard to pray with your, 
uh, uh, and wife pray, heart, pray for front of your husband? Because they know each other. Oh, God, bless my wife. Though I may want to kill her, oh, God, bless her. My wife, oh, God, bless that hard-headed, mule-headed husband you gave me. He is so thick-headed. I, I mean, somehow bless him, God. Uh, I, I'm through with him. That's all there is to it. Hey, man, come on. I'll write down to it, huh? If you can't get along, your prayers are hindered. Your prayers are hindered. Then if you've got unconfessed sin, Psalm 66. If you have iniquities, so if a man has iniquity, he don't expect to get your prayers answered. Hi, hi, listen. We come as, uh, we come as people with unconfessed sin. Well, you, well, I confess my sin. I confess my sin, and that should take care of it. No, 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 no. You don't seem to understand 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just what? To forgive us our sins, and then what? Cleanse us from unrighteousness. Now, you've got to look at that word unrighteousness. See? You mean God forgive? Yeah. No, oh, you don't seem to understand. You confess your sin, but you can't expect the God to forgive you that sin if you won't forsake it. Well, oh, that threw a calm over the crowd. That's the cold shower. You can't expect God to forgive the sin if you won't forsake it. So with unconfessed sin, you won't get, you won't, God won't answer prayer. We ask God selfishly. Remember over in the book of James what he says? You, you ask and you, and you ask amiss to consume it upon your lusts. You know, a people that's protected. And I started out this message that's cared for. A father who loves you. A savior who died for you. Who paid for your sin. Who rose again. Gives you the hope of eternal life. A God who, 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 who places within himself, within yourself, himself, his Holy Spirit, to live inside a new creature. It's not an old creature cleaner. This thing isn't cleaned up. Believe me. I don't care how many showers you took. It still stinks. I don't care how many times you squirt it and perfume it and pluck it and, and squeeze it and then whatever else you may do to it, my friend, it'll still get you in trouble if you're not careful. Boy, it's that new thing on the inside. That's that new person. That new person is God, Holy Spirit. He lives in you right now. He's giving you the Word of God for you to have direction and guidance. And, and then he's got the Holy, his, his Holy Spirit speaking with the Son, the Lord Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, who intercedes for you. Man, you're all taken care of. I'm all taken care of. Amen? Yeah, amen, brother. Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. But, but you don't seem to but you don't. Yeah, get your butt out of the road, and let's, well, let's go on this subject here. But, 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 you know, somebody said one time, it's an old joke, but you may like it. Somebody said most of our religion and most of our Christianity is like a motorboat religion, Christianity. But, 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 that's about it. It's about the truth of it. Where is this joy unspeakable? Where is this peace that passeth all understanding? Where is this John 14, 27? My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because the peace that I gave unto you will keep. Where is this thing here? <laughs> We're running around like a chicken with a head cut off. We just all tore to pieces. Where is this peace that passeth all understanding? Rightly divide the word of truth. And so on and so forth. You put away all sin. You put away the spirit of unbelief. And you put away all these things, and my dear friend, you, that's the, but, but that must be the divine factor, because I've done this, humanly speaking, I'm cleaned up, evidently God just didn't want to give it to me, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. Aha! Let us proceed to the solution. Now listen carefully. We agree that harbored sin will hinder prayers. We agree that unselfishness, or selfishness will, uh, will go unanswered. But there have been times that everything is right, the best way a person can be right, and still no answer. The solution is clear. To whom is God speaking in these prayers, such as Matthew 18, Matthew 21, and Mark chapter 11? The whatsoever's are contained in the Gospels is the message of the kingdom. Now listen to me, please. If that's what you want, if that's the kind of a prayer life that you want under the law, under the law, if that's the kind of a prayer life that you want, then you're going to have to get set for unanswered prayer. Because there's going to be some times that you, God cannot answer your prayer. For instance, under the law, David pray, Oh God, kill my enemy. God, go out, wipe out a whole army. Now you go ahead and pray, Oh God, wipe out Hussein. And he's still alive. What's the problem, friend? The problem is difference. The difference between law and grace. Under law, 
God would do it. Under grace, we're supposed to what? Suffer. Now, you don't like that. Americans don't like it. Americans don't want something. We ain't going to suffer. We're Americans. We ain't going to suffer. We want our rights. You have gun rights. Friend, you've got to be a citizen of a country to have rights. You got saved. You don't belong here anymore. Your citizenship is in heaven. Oh, I just don't like that kind of preaching. Whether you like it or not, it's going to make the difference, my friend, as to whether you're going to have peace and joy in your heart and your life. Most men at 70 years of age are pulling their hair out, wondering what they're going to do. I have more opportunities of service being handed to me every day that I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I've had some, I've had some of the most, what you would call glamorous, some of the glamorous, most wonderful opportunities. I have a group of 250 people sitting right on the Pacific Ocean in a valley where the sun shines. Every once in a while rains, but most of the time the sun is shining off the coast of Oregon that are just begging for me to come out and teach them the Word of God. I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I'm just tossing this thing out. And, and don't get any ideas that I'm going to leave someplace. I'm not telling you I'm going to leave anywhere. I'm not going to go anywhere. But I'm just trying to say to you right here now, my friend, you better get this thing straight, and I better get this thing straight, because there's a time coming where you're not going to know which way to turn. And then you're going to pray about it, and you're going to have unanswered prayer, and you're going to just pull the hair out of your head. If that's what you want, go under the law. Out of the dispensation of grace, we're supposed to suffer. Now, let me show you something about suffering, if I can. Anybody confused here so far? Just wait when I close up here, and then we'll be, and you can go home confused. Turn me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now notice that was back in Matthew, that was back in Mark, the gospel of the kingdom. Now if that's what you want, God will give it to you. But look where you are. You're not under the gospel of the kingdom, my friend. You're not under law, you're under grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look where you are. Look where you are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now get this straight and, and rightly divide and, and have an open heart. And don't be stubborn and don't say, well, he's a hyper dispensationist, blah, blah, blah. I'm not a hyper dispensationist. I can't even spell the word. I know that you're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. And I know that I don't have the capabilities, but the Spirit of God does. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's what I am now. I'm not David. Here's what I am now. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, no, uh, no, we, no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more after the flesh. Now, that's what it says. The after the flesh, I added to that. That's Sabacus' paraphrase. 17. Therefore, if any man be in what? Christ. He's what? A new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, a preacher, that's true. Uh, uh, but you know what? I still got some of you old have. Hey, that's got nothing to do with a new creature. That's still the old creature. You understand that? You're schizo. You have two people. You got the old man living out here, you got the new man living on the inside. Oh, not all things have passed away. Oh, he said all things have passed away. All things, uh, all things become new. You've got a new person on the inside that doesn't know anything about sin, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Won't have anything to do with sin. It's all the righteousness of God and all the blessings of God and all the joys of God and all the peace of God. No, but here we are, floundering around here, you know, buying long fingernails, short toenails, Painting our ears, painting our noses, paint. I'm not painting fingernails now, folks. Just don't, you know, I, I just do that to antagonize some folks once in a while. We all put our earrings on. Now we even got guys putting earrings on. From behind, I don't know if I should kiss them or slap them. I don't know who they are. You got, it's pretty tough, you know. It's pretty tough. I tell you, I, I'm about ready to do what that guy did out in California, that preacher. He had the solution, boy. I, this is not the message, but this is the solution to it. He, he's standing on a manhole cover. He's going, 33, 33, 33. Some hippie walked by and said, hey, man, what you doing there, man? Oh, he said, the preacher said, oh, I'm having fun. He said, what are you doing? 33, 33, 33. And the preacher's just going like that. And the hippie says, man, I don't see what's fun about that. He said, well, the trouble is you're not doing it, the preacher said. You do that. You'd be surprised how much fun it is. The hippie says, can I do that? The preacher says, yeah. So he said, one more time. He said, 33. 
After the hippie got on it, he jumped up in the air. The preacher pulled out the manhole cover, down with the guy, went through the manhole. The preacher got back on. 34! 34! <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Did everybody get that? <laughs> I thought I'd make one point. That's the third. That's point three and a half on my message, all right? Verse 7. Verse 7. Then if any man be, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's the new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, all things, all things have become new. But when I got a hold of that thing, I said, man, I'm alive. All things have become new. I don't care about this bird over here. There's something new inside of me. It's new. The old thing is 34. <laughs> Let him give me all the trouble. Psalm 78 says, yeah, he goes through Psalm 78. I'll never get through this message. He goes through Psalm 78 going down there telling Israel how much they've sinned, how many times they've sinned, how many times they've disobeyed God, how many times they've done this wrong, how many times they've done that wrong. And then he gets down there. I mean, he just gets through. He just lambastes them. And then he gets down there about verse 37, 38, something like that. He says, but he says, I know your flesh. Oh, thank God for God. Thank God for a God who has a loving and a forgiving heart. He says, I know your flesh. He says, Sabak, I know you're a dumbo. You preach good on Sunday, live on hell on Monday. No, I really don't, but pretty close to it. I get the temptations, the same temptations that you get. I don't know whether you get any temptations, but I get them just like you get. I'm not tempted with other women. I don't have any power because I got the best. So, I, what do you know that I don't know, huh? <laughs> You know her. I'm, I know her. I mean, I really mean it. Brother, boy, God, I tell you, never mind. You're a new creature. You're a new creature. You know what? That has not permeated your soul. That has not permeated. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. God has taken care of the thing. He himself came and resides in me. I don't, I, I'll, I'll slow it down a little bit there, brother. I'll slow it down. Verse 18. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us. Now watch that thing. Doesn't he say that in verse 17, Behold, all things are become new? What is this all things? And all things are of God. All things are of God. This new man who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the minister of reconciliation to wit that God was in the Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are what? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. I hope we get some ambassadors. We're, this administration running about half the world, a lot of ambassadors to countries, huh? Don't know what's going on, but that's neither here nor there. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in what? Watch that thing. Christ stead. Just as if Christ was here, you stand in his place. Christ didn't receive a crown. He received suffering. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made to what? The righteousness of God in him. Now, you are a new creature. Now, hold that thought for at least ten seconds. We will suffer as Jesus was called upon to suffer for the glory of God. Now, we think about suffering. You say, well, somebody's going to beat you on the head. or somebody's gonna... No, no, that's not the kind of suffering he's talking about. Remember the three things I taught you some time ago about the judgment seat of Christ? You have a proper foundation of the judgment seat of Christ. You'll never have any problems making any decisions. If you have a proper understanding, decisions will be easy to make. You'll never have any problems with living unholy. You'll live a holy life. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If you have an understanding of the judgment seat of Christ. And number three, you'll be able to, you'll be able to handle unfair criticism when it comes, and it'll come. Somebody says, you preachers got to me. Come on in. Come on in. That fellow tell me, said, boy, I'm telling you, you preachers have really got a maid. I said, if we really had a maid, you bum, you'd be in too. <laughs> Don't tell me. Come on in. There's plenty of room. Plenty of room. Plenty of room for suffering, for unfair criticism, 
plenty of room for saying, well, that guy preached to me this morning. I don't know why he's picking on me this morning. I just say, the guy says to me, uh, you were preaching to me this morning. I said, thank God. He said, well, now, wait a minute. I just didn't like what was said. Well, don't blame me. You said you preached to me. I gave you the word of God. Now, you take it from there. Uh, super sensitive. Just super sensitive. Just super. Uh, six months in the ministry will get rid of your super sensitivity. Get to the place where you just, hey. Because when that judgment seat of Christ comes, the Bible says in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3, he says those two eyes, like flames of fire, go into that heart, boy, and they'll know exactly what it is. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. He'll know every attitude then. He'll know every attitude then. And you make no excuses, and neither will I, because you will be known as you are in that day, and I believe it's around the corner. See, so your date setting, no. I just believe it's around the corner. Of course, if you're, living, if you're living in Boston, that's a real problem because the streets have no corners. They just go around and around. I've got to move along here. Under law, pray for God to kill somebody. As a righteous man, upholding his work, God would take care of that thing. Under dispensation of grace, you are to suffer. Some of you are already suffering. You're starting to stretch. Here's God's plan for your prayer life. Here is the mystery of God's purpose in this grace. A dispensation of grace. Turn me to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at it from the Bible. Not read some guy's book. Let's read it from the Bible. Can't handle hot preaching, can you, Dave, huh? Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse uh, uh, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, notice it says in Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. There's a difference. When he says Jesus Christ, Jesus is his earthly name, Christ is his heavenly name. It's going from earth to heaven. But when he says Christ Jesus, it's going from heaven to earth. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 13. Uh, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our, he is our, he is our, he is our. Somebody says, I don't have any peace. For well, he is our peace, who hath made one, uh, hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandment. He's abolished that. Ask and you shall receive. As far as God is concerned, uh, you can use it if you want to, but that second best, he's abolished that. He's given us something greater as far as prayer is concerned. And it's the kind of a prayer that gives you peace, that passeth all understanding, it's beyond man's comprehension. Verse 14, for he is our peace. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh, and so on and so forth. Turn me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8. I'm not giving you some man's idea. I'm reading to you from God's Word. And if you reject this, you're rejecting God's Word, and it's, your, and it's your problem, baby, not mine. I'm trying to be as honest as I can with you. This, this total confusion about prayer and this nonsense that we hear everywhere is amazing. It's not biblical. Oh, boy. Verse 8. Be not therefore ashamed. Chapter 1, 2 Timothy. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions. Be thou a partaker of the what? Afflictions of the gospel. According to the power of God, who hath saved us and, hath, and, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. Not according to our works. When you pray, boy, you better be careful. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given in us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, and so on and so forth. My friend, listen to me. The gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer. We're going to have affliction. It isn't always give me what I want. God knows best, and he wouldn't give us half the stuff we ask for. What are you getting at, preacher? I'm coming to close. I'm coming to a close. Turn me to Romans chapter 8. 
Ah, don't come to any conclusions now. Let me finish. Let me finish. Then you can go out and cuss me out all you want to, but don't do it here. Please just listen carefully. He said, yeah, but he doesn't seem to understand. Yes, I do understand. Yes, I do understand. I understand that God's word is true. Now let's read this verse here. Boy, we don't have to read it. We all know it by heart, don't we? Look at Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them to love God, to them to call according to the purpose. Amen? Boy, we all know that. Well, my friend, that's a dumb way to read. I've heard preachers take that verse and do all kinds of expositions and all kinds. I mean, this is true and this is true and it's all good. I don't know why this is happening and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. What a blessing they are. Well, uh, Romans chapter 8, my, mom, my, my wife and I are divorcing, and, you know, I just don't see how God gets joy. But he says, so, okay, he's going to get joy out. Nah, nah, I just don't understand things. Listen, my friend, that's no help to you. Now, look at that thing up there in verse 26. Now, here's the help. Verse 26, chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities. For we know not what we have. <laughs> Give me a pen. Let me scratch that out. I don't like that part of the Bible. For we, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Not only don't we don't know what we... How we ought to pray. O-U-G-H-T. I see some of you are really confused and you just can't wait for the conclusion of this thing here. Well, I'm going to make you suffer a couple more minutes so I get this thing straight here and you... I make you suffer long enough, and when you get to the conclusion, the, the light will burst over you, and you'll say, Glory! Some of you won't take, take it. You won't take it. You want to go back to the hard way. You talk about trusting God because He saved you. It's going to prove it right now, whether you really trust Him about your salvation. Now, where was it? Verse 26. For we know not, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings and cannot be uttered. It's not spirit himself, it's spirit itself. I'm talking about your groanings and your utterings, the things that you ought to say, the way you ought to pray. So the, so the writers of the King James Bible knew what they were doing. you got a book that says, he, you missed it. You lost the whole concept. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Good preaching, Brother Sabaka. Keep it up. Good work, man. Good work. Some of you look at me like you said, man, what is that nut up there? I'm going to tell you, this, this nut up here got saved when he was 26, just 26 years of age. Come out of the military, lived like hell, just acted like hell and smelled like hell, and one day God saved me and I haven't gotten over it yet. And he gave me a book. And I was so stupid when I got saved that in three months' time I read through this book and it didn't make any sense to me. But God said I had a heart for his word. And so he did something. I believe it. Verse 27. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Say, it's not your mind, but knows what the mind of the Spirit. <laughs> Look at that thing. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How dare you pray apart from the Holy Spirit, taking your prayer to the very throne of God? How dare? Well, you're asking for trouble. Yeah, but you know, there's some folks that just make so much of the Holy Spirit, they just jump around and scream. And I'll tell you something, I'm going to preach on that tonight. Not on that part of it, I'm going to preach on that tonight. Some folks make, some folks make out the Holy Spirit more than what He should be. He is never to be worshipped. That's blasphemy. That's sin before Almighty God, according to the Word of God. So recognize Him who He is. Well, the first thing He says, because He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things were... Ha, now you see Romans 8, 28 makes some you don't know how to pray as you are. I don't know how to pray as we are. And the Spirit of God Himself, God the Father who knows the mind of the Spirit, He Himself makes groanings for us. And, 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 and takes our petitions, even though you don't know how to say it or don't know what to say. And let me show you how that works now. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We know not how we ought to pray. We don't know what we should pray for as we are. You need to know that you know not. You need to know that this morning, that you know not. That's what the God's Word said. Ye know not. Well, then how am I supposed to know, Lord? Well, the first thing you've got to know is that you know not. See, you've got to be teachable. You understand that? See, know not and know are opposite ends of the pole. 
If you know not, then that makes you teachable. If you know, that won't make you teachable. I, I know not. God, I know not. But I'm willing to be taught. Let me know, Lord. It is, people. Some book. Some book. Some book. Some book. We're going to get to heaven some of these days. We're going to get up and say, boy, if I'd have just read this, or if I'd have just read that, how much easier it would have been, you know? Come on now. Come on now. How wonderful. This fits our present circumstance right now. We live in a darkened time, folks. We live in a darkened age. If we received everything we asked for, what a calamity. You know that. What is needed in a darkened age is, God, give us light. The way is dark, and I cannot see one step before me. Help, Lord. I know not how I ought to pray, but I do know that there is a, a Holy Spirit. There is this Holy Spirit of God. Thy Spirit lives within me, and He knows exactly what I need, and He knows exactly how to get to heaven, and He knows exactly how I ought to pray. Oh, God, therefore I know that all things work together for good. Does not verse 28 make sense now? I guess I'm the only brilliant one in the bunch. I understand it. Okay. Turn me to Philippians chapter 4. I've got to finish it. We don't tell you. Unless you want to come back tonight, maybe I'll get the rest of it tonight. No, no, I'll finish it. Philippians chapter 4. Now we're closing. Here we come. The highest expression of faith is Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. Philippians chapter 4. This is what's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Now watch, look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Well, I'm glad God put that in there. Because I'm kind of a wild, reckless individual anyhow. Be careful for nothing. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. he didn't say that. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And there it is. Now look at that thing. You see, we place so much emphasis. Look at that verse 6. We place so much emphasis by prayer and supplication. And we miss the one thing. Thanksgiving. Well, how can you be thankful if God doesn't answer your prayer? Now look, this is just a practical lesson. That's stupid. You expect me to be happy, God? You didn't answer my prayer. Well, he said, be thankful with joy. Didn't he say that? Look at that in verse 7. Doesn't he say something over there? But, what no, verse 7. Uh, and, and the peace of God, let your request be made unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth what? You don't know how you ought to pray. Well, here's the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The high expression of faith. Be careful for nothing. Be, don't be full of care about something. When the troubles and trust, don't be full of care. But and in everything, he said prayer and supplication. Go ahead and tell him about it. Regardless of what it is, tell him about it. The Father loves to hear it. Loves to hear it. But now listen, my friend. He said the, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Is that what he says over there in verse 6? Maybe I'm reading that thing wrong. In everything, by prayer and supplication. That's what he says. Just tell him everything. Be careful. Be ca don't be full of care. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, and God, why, and what term he asks, you shall receive in prayer. Is that what it says? Sure it doesn't. Not my Bible. Be careful for nothing but in prayer, and, but everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God. So there's a quality missing here, something in our prayer life. And the peace of God. When you pray, Child is sick, wife is sick, out of job, whatever the case. When you pray, my pray, pray, friend, you pray with, with thanksgiving and the peace of God, knowing that it's in God's hand. Watch this very carefully. We don't, we know not what we should pray for as we are. We know that. Here is ample proof that our Heavenly Father is not deaf to the cries of His children this age. He wants them to pour out all of their hearts before Him. There's nothing he doesn't want to hear about. Nothing. I, I don't care what it is. You tell it. I don't care how minute it seems, how silly it seems, how stupid it seems. 
You tell him, the Spirit of God will make it clear and plain. He wants to hear. He says, tell me everything. But be anxious about nothing. For I'll work it all out for your good. Now, faith and trust come into being. Ready to trust God for our salvation, but the minute the baby gets sick, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. He says, tell me about it, and I'll work it out. Can I say something as tenderly as I can? He who loves you and saves you is living inside of you. And he's working out, already he's worked out the past. He's now working out the present to get you ready for the future. That doesn't bring any peace in your heart. I got nothing else to say to you. Learn this lesson. Learn this lesson. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, not peace with God. Peace with God is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The peace with God and the peace of God are two different things. Peace with God is that you've been reconciled to God and you and God are no longer enemies. But the peace of God comes after you have been reconciled to Him. Now the peace of God comes into your heart and life and you can walk the Christian life. And why are some people just never down the dumps? they got as many problems as you have. You know why? Because they got the thing settled. And it's the peace of God that rules in their hearts and their life. The peace of God. Doesn't he say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by faith and not by sight? What's he talking about? Talking about your whole life. You walk by faith. And not by sight. Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm through. You make a choice this morning. I'm going to ask you a question. i ask you a question. Do you want Matthew chapter 21, verse 22? Asking you shall receive. Do you want that? You can have it. It's second best. You can have it. It's under the law, but you can still have it. And God will answer your prayer sometimes, and sometimes He won't. And you go through life, scars on your soul because of the fact that God has not answered your prayer. Do you want that? Or do you want this? Look at this thing. Ephesians chapter 3. One of the great portions of God's Word, verse 20 and 21. Ephesians chapter 3. Read it very carefully. Now unto Him that is able to do what? Say it to me, somebody. Exceeding what? About what? Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Now listen. There's how you pray. If you want peace. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? He says you can he said, uh, where am I here? Come on, find it's about the three twenty. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Why should you ask him? You come to him and you present by prayer and supplication. I notice it said prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Knowing. Knowing. Listen to me, please. That he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask or you could ever think. We've got a God in heaven who wants us to trust Him, who's working out a purpose in His life. We're living in a dispensation where we're going to be uh, humiliated and we're going to be uh, accused of wrong things and we're going to be laughed at and mocked at. But my dear friend, it's no different than what they did to your Savior. If you're the Son of God, come on down from that cross. Pull those nails out. Come on, you phony Jew, hanging up there saying that you're, like, you're God. If you were God, we couldn't have put the nails in there in the first place. Who do you think you are? Come on down from there. He could have ripped those nails out. He, my friend, he could have come down and wiped it, but he didn't because he loved you and me. And you know what? That same one that took that abuse says, now listen, he that will not suffer, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Boy, I can't go any longer. I can't go any longer. I've got to quit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, he that will not suffer will not reign with me. Now, he didn't say he that will suffer with me. No, 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 no. He's in heaven. So he that will not suffer, that means you're going to suffer someplace where he's not. So that you can reign with him. So you can reign with him someplace where he is. Now, do you understand it? Oh, God, please let that birth to live. Oh, God, please let that birth to live. Oh, God, please. Now, maybe he will or maybe he won't. 
And if he does, fine. If he doesn't, then you bear another scar, and you don't have any answer. You say, well, it was just God's purpose, and, and you know that doesn't satisfy you. But here it is. You don't know how you ought to pray, amen? That's what he says. But he says, all things work together for good. Why? Because the Spirit of God will take that prayer and then present it to him. And then we trust the Father who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we think or ask. And that's prayer. Present the petitions to him. Well, you know what our problem is? We present the petitions to him, and then we want to help him out. What's wrong with you, God? You know, you're a little too slow here. Speed it up here a little bit. Let's get, you know, we're, don't you know we're living in the 90s? Now this is the fast generation. Man, if you don't do it, I'll take a fix. And I'm all ready to go, you know. Silly stuff, you know. Doing everything to speed it up. God takes his time. God takes his time. I don't care what's happened in the past. Let's begin today. Let's begin today. Let's begin today to be a church filled with people that are going to be satisfied to put it all in his hands. Apart from that, prayer doesn't make any sense, folks. Apart from that, prayer does not make any sense. I've been scarred just like you. Prayed, didn't come through. Ah, uh, what the I'm, you know, I'm getting fed up with this business of praying. And, and, you know, I didn't quit on Christianity, but I just saw oh, there's no really no sense in praying about the thing. You know, that's, mom's lying there sick. She's dying. Well, eh, what's the sense of praying about God? You're going to do what you want to. You know what I'm saying? Come on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what's the sense of praying about things? Because the Father wants to hear from me. That old man, 97 years old, he still wants to hear from me. 97 years old, singing as loud as anybody in this place. Rejoicing. They're going to bust heaven one of these days, get a hold of mom. They're both going to go to Jesus. He's going to put his arm around and said, you know what? You raised four boys. And Dad, I heard your prayer. Oh, God, don't let the devil get my boys. He wipe marks on his forehead. Don't let the devil get my boys. That devil hasn't gotten one. Of course, I think God was a little bit hard up when he called one to preach. But there it is. Call that preaching? Come on now. Here's a dollar bill. Here's a thousand dollars. Which one do you want? Come on, which one do you want? Well, come on. Anybody would take a thousand dollars? We'll, we don't want you back. There's something wrong with you anyhow. Okay. Here's a dollar. Here's a thousand dollars. You want what you ask for? With a chance that he won't answer your prayer because it's not the best thing for you? Or you just want to bring your petitions to him, realizing that you don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God will take those petitions up, and then waiting, 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 and see how he does exceeding abundantly that you could think or ask. People, there's a God up there who loves us. We're living in a fast world. We haven't got sense one. We haven't got brain one. We're moving along. We're trying to keep up with was well, it God up there just watched and said, good night. What's going on with those crazy people? They said they're saved. They said they're trusting me. Supposed to have peace and joy. I just don't understand why God's doing this. Oh, I don't understand why God's doing this. I don't understand why God's doing this. Well, who said you're supposed to understand? You've got a finite brain. That's infinite God. But understand one thing. He loves you. He gave his son to die for you. Brought his son forth alive from the grave. His son sits at his right hand interceding for you. He's given you his Holy Spirit to live within you. And he's given the Word of God. There's no better people, better equipped to handle life than we as born-again Christians. And yet we just flutter and don't know what's going on. I hope this helps. I got peace. You're looking at a contented man. I got problems. I got troubles just like anybody else. I got to pay bills. I have not been able to after over, over, over 60, about 55 years of trying to make friends with the IRS, I've never been able to make friends with them. I've got as many troubles as you have, our old buddies. I've got all kinds of problems, just like you have. But you know what? I've got peace. I'm contented because I know who holds the future. I know whatever I tell him, he's working it out. I may have to suck with the thing for a while, That's what, but I'm not going to go apy. I'm not going to go crazy. I'm not going to go wild. And boy, let me tell you something. About the time you accept that thing, the old devil is going to give you a fit. I was right getting ready to preach this message on Thursday night. The 
the first time, and honey, you forgive me for this. First time, she's running a fever of 103 or 104. I well, just come back from the doctor, and he said, you're, you've got a strep, almost a strep infection through your whole system. He says, your tonsils and your tongue and your mouth is all one white pus. She couldn't talk, and she called me. She said, honey, I'm going to preach to 600 or 700 people, and I'm going to preach on this very message. She said, honey, and she started to cry. Now, I've never heard my wife do this. She said, I wish you were here. I'm scared. I went up and preached this message to the people. I said, what would you do? I committed to the Lord, knowing it was too good and too kind to make a mistake. And I trusted him. And I trusted him. And I trusted him. You're not listening. Look, look, look at some guy who just preaches. I have gone through the things that you've gone through. I've experienced the same thing, and I find out there's a God in heaven who can and will supply. Brother Zabaka, that's some of the finest preaching I have ever heard. <laughs>